according to the cloud, all set. According to the PC, ready. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Hope, you may begin with your opening statement. Thank you, Sergeant Paulette. Good morning and welcome to the New York City Council Remote Hearing on Higher Education. At this time, with all panelists, please turn on your videos. I repeat, all panelists, please turn on your videos. Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Barron, we are ready to begin. Good morning, and thank you for joining the Committee on Higher Education for this very important hearing on the Research Foundation of the City University of New York, CUNY. I'm Council Member Inez Barron, Chair of the Committee and a proud alum of Hunter College. Thank you for everyone who is here to testify today. But before I address the topic at hand, I have to comment on the state budget. Finally, the state will comply with the court ordered mandate regarding the campaign for fiscal equity and pay $1.4 billion for the next three years to reach the $4 billion owed to black and brown school districts. In 2009, Cuomo had insisted that CFE was done quote unquote but by passing the CFE settlement in this budget, the legislature has honored its requirement to repair the inadequate funding that has been due to black and brown children for nearly two decades. I also want to note that this budget rejects the proposed tuition hikes and freezes tuition for the next three years which brings us closer to my goal of returning to a tuition-free CUNY. Also, there's an increase in the TAP award by $500, raising that maximum to $5,665 and a three-year plan to fully eliminate the TAP gap. Uh, they're getting closer with the uh, college-based aid uh, and they're raising that although it doesn't anywhere come near the need that is uh, existing. It restores 26 million operating aid to CUNY. There's $100 million for CUNY capital aid. And there is, I'm not sure the amount, I see different numbers, but the opportunity programs have been increased finally by 20%. And I'm so pleased to say that there's a new $10 million scholarship for CUNY for the Martin Luther King Scholarship, which was advocated by my husband, introduced by my husband, and it addresses non-tuition needs. 2.5 million for ASAP, 902 million for childcare centers, and something called rental aid, not quite sure what that is. But certainly in this budget, we can see that we're beginning to close the deficiencies that have existed for so many years in CUNY's budget from the state. The purpose of today's hearing is to better understand a rarely examined institution, the Research Foundation of CUNY. The Research Foundation at CUNY, also known as RF CUNY or the Foundation, is an independent nonprofit entity that supports CUNY faculty and staff research efforts. According to its website, for fiscal year 2020, the foundation worked with 25 partner institutions, employed an estimated 11,000 individuals, and was responsible for nearly $581 million in contributions and grants. RF CUNY helps obtain funding from government and private sponsors, oversees the administration of funded programs, and assists with managing capital construction projects and facilities renovation. In essence, the foundation provides significant financial and operational support for the benefit of the entire university. I'm particularly eager about today's hearing because to my knowledge, this may be the first time RF, Q RF CUNY 
has been examined by the city council. This topic was originally noticed in February of last year, but for reasons beyond my control, the hearing was canceled and only recently rescheduled for today. Regardless, this is not the first time the foundation has been subjected to governmental inquiry. In 2016, a federal investigation was launched after the foundation paid over $150,000 in reimbursements to the former city college president's personal expenses. The investigation ended without any indictments, but the Office of the Inspector General published a report recommending that the university institute more controls over the relationships between all CUNY-based foundations and their partner colleges to, assure, to ensure proper fiscal oversight of the foundation's funds managed by those schools. Over the past six fiscal years, the council has awarded a total of $16.3 million or an average of 2.7 million a year to support programs and initiatives administered through the foundation. In, in fiscal year 2021, the council designated a total of $2.8 million to support some of the following program areas, higher education, education, public safety, and cultural organizations. And it's very concerning to think that there could be a misspent taxpayer dollar at a university that is meant to be, quote, of vital importance as a vehicle for the upward mobility of the disadvantaged in the city of New York. It is imperative that we hold our public institutions to a high standard. In addition to myself, many of my colleagues in government wouldn't be here today if it weren't for CUNY. And I expect that the money we fight for for CUNY is exactly that money properly spent at CUNY. At today's hearing, the committee will seek an overview of RF CUNY, its structure and its operations, as well as its relationship with each CUNY Campus Research Foundation. This includes basic data on where funding is secured, where funding is sourced, how it is distributed, how it is spent, and if possible, a demographic breakdown of award recipients. The committee will also seek clarity around how foundations may spend money for non-research purposes, more specifically for the employment of foundation staff. This includes a demographic breakdown of RF CUNY employees, information concerning full and part-time employees, their salaries and lines of employment. Lastly, I'm looking forward to hearing about how the foundation benefits CUNY and the CUNY community. And I'm grateful for everyone who is here today to share. I want to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, member of the committee, Council Member Maisel, and I saw Council Member Rosenthal, and others will be joining us as we proceed. I also want to acknowledge my staff, Chief of Staff Omawali Clay, M. Indigo Washington, my Director of Legislation and CUNY Liaison, Chloe Rivera, the committee's senior policy analyst, Amy Briggs, the committee's counsel, Michelle Peregrin, the committee's financial analyst, and Frank Perez, the committee's community engagement representative. And additionally, I would like to thank all the council staff, including the sergeants at arm, who are working so hard behind the scenes to make this hearing possible. I would like, now like to uh, turn over to Chloe Rivera, the senior policy analyst who will re review some procedural items relating to today's hearing and call the first panel. Thank you, Chair Barron. My name is Chloe Rivera and I serve as the senior policy analyst of the Committee on Higher Education at the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, Please remember that everyone will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by a member of our staff. Note there will be a few second delay before you are unmuted and we can hear you. For public testimony, I will call up individuals and panels. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce the next few panelists. Once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. The Sergeant at Arms will set a clock and give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. For today's hearing, the first panel will include representatives from the Research Foundation of CUNY, followed by council member questions, then public testimony. 
For the Research Foundation, we will have Darnay Bramlett, the interim president of the Research Foundation of CUNY. I will now administer the oath to the administration. Please respond once a member of our staff unmutes you. Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? President Bramlett? Yes, I do. Thank you. You may begin presenting your testimony. Good morning, Chairperson Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee. I am Jarnay Bramlett, Interim President and Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer of the Research Foundation of the City University of New York. I have been with the Research Foundation of CUNY for over 25 years. I was appointed Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer in April of 2020 and Interim President in December of 2020. I welcome the opportunity to speak with you about the Research Foundation of CUNY. The Research Foundation of CUNY, uh, the Research Foundation of the City University of New York, or RF, is a private not-for-profit corporation established in 1963 under the laws of the state of New York. According to its charter, the research, the RS purpose is to encourage the making of gifts and grants to the City University of New York or CUNY, to receive, hold, and administer gifts and grants on behalf of CUNY, to finance the conducting of research studies for the benefit of CUNY, and to enter into contractual relationships appropriate to the RS purpose. In 1983, the RF entered into an agreement with CUNY to administer sponsored programs for all of CUNY op CUNY's operations. The 1983 agreement designated the RF as the fiscal agent for administering all grants and contracts awarded to any unit of CUNY. In 1983, the 1983 agreement specifies the RF's responsibilities to include assisting CUNY and identifying funds from public and private donors to support uh, programs at CUNY, serving as joint grantee and ap applying for such funds, administering grants and contracts in accordance with the terms and conditions, employing necessary personnel to conduct the programs who shall be deemed the employees of the RF and not CUNY, purchasing necessary equipment and supplies, providing administrative functions, including controlling and accounting for expenditures, and establishing policies and procedures governing all expenditures. The CUNY faculty and staff were responsible, responsible for identifying, obtaining, and managing these sponsored funds are referred to as principal investigators. Once, award, once funding is awarded, the RF manages the post-award process pursuant to the 1983 agreement, which specifies that the RF should monitor all expenditures for availability of funds, for compliance with RF policies and sponsor requirements and maintaining auditable accounts and render periodic expenditure reports. Oversight of the award or compliance with these terms is a responsibility of the college. Pursuant to the 1983 agreement, the college will comply with sponsor requirements, university policy and applicable governmental laws and regulations and will expedite the processing of applications. The college will also see that the principal investigator carries out a sponsored project in compliance with the terms of the award, university policy, and city and state requirements. CUNY's responsibility for compliance was reaffirmed in the March 2012 letter between the CUNY's general counsel and the RF president. The RF reserves the the RF serves as fiscal administrator and provides oversight on the spending to the extent of assess, assuring that spending compl complies with established budgets, but compliance with the terms of the award is CUNY's responsibility. The 1983 agreement is still in effect, but may be terminated by either the RF or CUNY upon one year's notice to, to the other party. <coughs> Excuse me. The RF is a private not-for-profit corporation, but CUNY is a public university. 
The benefits of being a private rather than governmental corporation were a major consideration in CUNY selection of the RF to administer the sponsored programs. The RS status for the RS status allows for greater flexibility in administering sponsored programs than would be the case if the RF were an arm of CUNY. The legal and fiscal separation of the RF and CUNY also prevents the commingling of tax levy and, and sponsored funds, which come from private and public sources. Unlike CUNY, the RF receives no government appropriated or tax levy funds from any local, county, state, or federal government or political subdivision for the operation of its business. The RS operating revenues are principally derived from administrative fees charged to CUNY for the services it provides pursuant to the 1983 agreement. The RF also obtains income from the ownership of the building where its central office is located. <coughs> Excuse me. This property is a private office building owned by 230 West 41st Street LLC is a, is a, a limited liability company that was formed to acquire, own and operate the building. The RF is the sole member of the LLC. Previously, the RF also derived revenue from Grants Plus. That corporation was created by the RF to provide host award administration of sponsored programs for nonprofit organizations other than the RF and CUNY. However, all activities of Grants Plus Incorporated ended on June 30th of 2019. The income from the income for RF obtained from the LLC and Grants Plus was used to support its operations. The RS annual budget is approved by the RS Board of Directors. It is not reviewed or approved by CUNY or any other governmental body or political subdivision. The RF files its own tax returns, issues its own independently audited financial statements, operates its own payroll and financial accounting systems, fringe benefit plans, and purchases a wide variety of goods and services in accordance with its own rules and regulations. The RF staffs and maintains its own operating divisions, such as human resources, legal, finance, internal audit, grants and contracts, procurement and payables, award pre-proposal support and information technology. The RF maintains its own policies and procedures and practices relating to human resources, employees, employee and labor relations. The health, retirement, and workers' compensation plans maintained by the RF for its employees are private in nature, and the RS pension and benefit plans are subject to the Employee and Retirement Income Security Act, or ERISA. The RF retains private outside counsel when it requires representation or services that exceed the capabilities of its in-house legal department. The RF is not represented by a governmental agency in any legal proceeding or action in court. Although the RF provides the function of postal board fiscal administration for CUNY's grants and contracts, the RF operates independently of CUNY in performing this function. The RF is not owned, operated, or controlled by CUNY or any other governmental entity. The RF is governed by its board of directors. The composition of the board of the RF board is established by its bylaws. In order to ensure that all segments of the CUNY community are fairly represented, some RF directors are affiliated with CUNY. This enables the RF to provide better service to CUNY and its member colleges while contributing to the diversity of view, viewpoints and body of knowledge. The 17 member board of directors is comprised of the chancellor of CUNY or his or her designee who serves ex, as ex officio, the president of the graduate school and university center who also serves ex officio, two individuals appointed by the chancellor, four at-large members nominated by a nominating committee and then elected by the board who may not be, who, who may not be employed by or under contract to the RFO CUNY, two senior college presidents who are elected by the board uh, by their fellow CUNY college presidents, two community college presidents who are elected to the board by their fellow CUNY uh, college presidents, 
four faculty members, namely the chairperson of the Faculty Advisory Council, who serves ex officio, and three other faculty members selected by the Faculty Advisory Council, and one full-time CUNY graduate student selected by the CUNY Doctoral Student uh, Council. Uh, other than the chancellor, none of the CUNY representatives hold a position of control over CUNY. The chancellor has only one vote on the RS Board of Directors. Under the bylaws, the chancellor as chairperson of the RS Board has no indiv individual authority other than to call meetings to the board, to preside at meetings of the board, to sign and execute RF documents, and to perform other duties at the request of the board. The appointment and removal of the RF Board of Directors is governed solely by the bylaws and without reference to any statute or other law. The RS Board of Directors is independent of CUNY, does not report to CUNY, and cannot be removed by CUNY. <clears throat> Excuse me. CUNY exercises no authority over the RF directly or indirectly through the RS Board of Directors. The RS bylaws do not provide a single seat on the RF Board of Directors for a member of CUNY's governing board of trustees, which presides oversight over CUNY. While the RS Board of Directors is ultimately responsible for the RF, RS day-to-day -day operations are managed and carry out, carried out by its administration, managers, and supervisory personnel who work at RS Central Office location, who work at the RS Central Office located at 230 West 41st Street, New York, New York, 10036. CUNY does not have authority to hire or fire the executive staff of the RF such as its president, chief financial officer, chief operating officer, chief counsel, chief information officer, or any other RS central office employee. The RS human resources, legal, finance, internal audit, grants and contracts, procurement and payables, award pre-proposal support, and information technology departments are all located at the RS central office. The RF does not maintain any offices on any CUNY campus or in any CUNY office building. While there are numerous RF employees working on CUNY campuses, those field employees perform work for and on behalf of CUNY in connection with the sponsored grants, awards, and programs. The offices and buildings on CUNY campuses where RF field employees perform work on sponsored grants, awards, and programs are not the RF offices or locations. As fiscal agent, the RF administers over 500 million in federal, state, city, and private sponsored programs awarded to CUNY. CUNY's PIs and staff who engage in sponsored programs are required to comply with RF policies and sponsoring agency regulations regarding the management of awards in accordance with internal controls. Since the RF receives over 750,000 in federal funds on behalf of CUNY and its colleges, it is required to undergo an annual audit by an independent accounting firm retained by the RS Board of Directors. The RF is also subject to cyclical audits from sponsors. RF employs up to 6,000 employees at any one time and 11,000 overall each year. Currently, the number of full-time and part-time employees is 2,000 and 4,000, respectively. The RF has two types of employees referred to as central office employees and field employees. Central office employees are those employees working in the various administrative departments at the RF central office location. Currently, there are 191 central office employees that are exclusively chosen by the RF. The wages and salaries of central office employees are paid by the RS operating revenues pursuant to the 1983 agreement. The field employees are those employees hired to work on research programs and other activities for which outside su uh, sponsors support. While field employees are identified and selected by the principal investigator on whose project the employees will be working, the RF must approve and effectuate the hire after co confirming that the candidate meets all necessary qualifications and legal requirements. While the principal investigators have critical input on hiring and firing decisions for field employees, the RF is at all times the employer of record and accordingly must comply with all applicable government 
laws, rules, and regulations. The wages and salaries for field employees are paid by the RF utilizing monies from grants, awards, and sponsored programs. Currently, there are over 5,500 field employees physically working on CUNY campuses in connection with sponsored programs, grants, and awards. For all RF employees, benefits are given based on the employee's employment status, that is full-time versus part-time. Employees who are appointed to work at least 35 hours a week are classified as full-time and eligible for full benefits. Employees who are appointed to work less than 35 hours a week are classified as part-time and benefits will vary based on their part-time classification. Benefits to RF employees are based solely on the hours appointed and worked through the RF. Those benefits are defined by RF policy and may be different from those benefits given by CUNY to CUNY employees. Thank you, that is my report to the committee. Thank you very Thank you. much. I'm sorry, Chloe. Uh, Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, I will now call on council members with questions in the order that they have used the raise hand function. I'm sorry, council member, Chair Barron. I threw you off. <laughs> no problem. You may begin with your question. Uh, thank you uh, very much. And thank you for the, the panel, the testimony. It's, um, quite extensive. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's quite extensive and it indicates so much of what we have had a desire to know for such a long period of time. Um, I'll first start and then um, I'll take a break. Normally I go through all my questions and then turn it over to, to my colleagues, but I've invited particular colleagues to be here of the expertise they have. So I'm going to do my questioning in, in bunches so that my okay. colleagues who have very busy schedules can maximize their time. So what was the purpose of creating the Research Foundation as a separate entity? And it seems that CUNY has actually no authority over what they do. Well, uh, going back to our charter, our charter indicates that we were created as a separate entity to receive, hold, and administer grants and contracts on behalf of CUNY. So how does that contribute to CUNY's giving a uh, guiding mission statement to operate it in an integrated fashion? It seems like it's you know, a, a wall that's here, but there's some gaps in the wall and sometimes, sometimes things seem to go through these gaps. But how does that, how does that provide an integrated functioning? Well, the charter error requires, uh, the char charter states that we're a separate entity for the purpose of administering these sponsored programs, but also uh, for the um, separation of the tax levy versus the sponsored programs. Uh, again, we're separate entities um, and the RF was created to administer grants and contracts for CUNY as a separate entity, a nonprofit. And that was in 1983. So what happened before 1983? The, the 1983 is an agreement that was set up with uh, CUNY and the RF for the, identifies the responsibilities of each entity in the process of administering sponsored programs. So before 1983, what was happening? What was the structure? What was the operation? I, I honestly, I believe the operation was the same. I think the 1983 agreement just confirmed the rules and responsibilities of each entity. It put information on paper as far as what what responsibilities CUNY was responsible for as far as the oversight of the award versus the RF in the administration of the project. So just clarified the roles the of the two entities in, okay. in the process of administering sponsored programs. Okay, because the foundation was, I think, in 1963. 1963, so, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, so are there cost savings or operational efficiencies that are associated with having a separate research foundation? And if so, tell us what they are. Um, I don't have a course study, but I will say that the RF has been administering sponsored programs for over 50 years. We are very skilled and trained. This is all that we do. So there are efficiencies in that, in that there's no other types of funds that we're administering that we are focusing on to that extent. 
So this is uh, something that we have been doing for over 50 years. We have skilled staff who understands the various sponsor requirements, uh, the various sponsor reporting, um, and that uh, skill set is, is something that is creating a, a more streamlined and, and efficient process overall for CUNY. Well, I understand that it's very exclusive um, and I understand it's a particular skill set, but uh, I would really like to know how you quantify that and say that that's a cost savings. Uh, I, don't, I don't have any quantification of it as a cost savings. I've not done an analysis in that regard. I'm just talking um, essentially from the structure and the length of time that we've been doing it. Um, this centralized process appears to be a more efficient way as opposed to dis decentralized, but I don't have a course study. I, I'm, I don't have any um, evidence of a course study to share with the committee on that. Okay. Um, so how are we, how do we ensure ongoing alignment with CUNY's interests? How do we know the benefits that we're getting? We measure that. Yeah, well, we are, as RF as a nonprofit a fiscal agent for CUNY, we are always in direct contact and communication with CUNY. Um, we work hand in hand with the CUNY PI and staff. We work with the administrators of CUNY. So we maintain alignment through our communications. Uh, we meet regularly with their CUNY officials, the Council of Presidents, uh, so that we are ensured that we are in line with uh, the overall mission of, of what CUNY is doing. But again, our process, our administration, a sponsor programs is also uh, the focus of our, um, of our work. And we also make sure that we stand in alignment with what the sponsor requirements are as well. How often do you meet with the Council of Presidents? Uh, monthly, monthly. Okay. Uh, besides the award of grants and funding, how does the Research Foundation support its operation? Uh, the Research Foundation is a sole member of an LLC, 230 West 41st Street LLC. And that uh, entity was created to own, operate, and, and manage the facility, the office building. Uh, so there are uh, income that's used from the LLC to support its operations, to help offset its operations. And what does that amount? Um, it's usually around, this year it's going to be about $1 million. In the past, it's been maybe two. Um, due to the uh, economy and with what's going on with the pandemic, there's been a drop in revenues, but it's about 1 million this year. And what is the role, uh, since the RF is an independent entity, what is the role of the chancellor in that board of directors? Uh, the chancellor is the chair of the board. Uh, the chancellor's responsibility, uh, his uh, responsibility actually is to call meetings, uh, to lead over those meetings. He's um, also required to sign documents as needed and other duties that the board may request of him. Okay, can you please describe the role of Nick Stahl, the Senior Vice President of Preclinical -clin -pre Development and Biomolecular Science uh, Pharmaceuticals in the CUNY Board of Directors and where is he cited? Yeah, Neil Stahl is an at-large board member. Um, he is um, he's been an at-large member for some time on the RS board. Um, he serves as executive vice president of research and development at Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, and he's been in that role since January of 2015. Um, to our knowledge, he's not, uh, as he, Mr. Stahl does not uh, work on any CUNY campus. He is an at-large board member of the RF board of directors. Okay, uh, I don't recall, I didn't have your testimony in front of me, so I can't refer to it, but I don't recall you mentioning at-large members. I, as I, part of yes, I did. There were four at-large members on the board. Okay. Yes. You called them, okay, yes. four who were mm -hmm. by the nominated committee. Okay, those are yes. the at mm -hmm. Okay. And do you know who the other three members of that at-large uh, division are? The other three members, are there are vacant seats. We are in the process of filling those vacant seats. And how does someone get nominated to fill a and, vacant? Yeah, there's a nominating committee that will elect someone and then the board makes the decision. 
Okay. Um, I'm going to, I have more questions, but I'm going to uh, turn it over to the moderator to allow my colleagues to ask their very pointed questions from their background in finances in particular. Okay. So Madam Moderator, you can call. Uh, thank you, Chair Barron. I will now call on council members with questions in the order that they have used their raise hand function in Zoom. Council members, if you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the raise hand function in Zoom, please do so now. Also, please remember to keep questions and answers to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will maintain a clock and a member of our staff will unmute you. You may begin after I call on you and the Sergeant gives you the cue. We will now hear questions from Council Member Rosenthal. Time starts now. We can hear you. Yes. Oh, I've been unmuted. Terrific. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Uh, Councilmember Barron, as always, your questions are perfect, and it's so interesting to hear about the Research Foundation. I, I really appreciate your calling this hearing, and um, Ms. Bramlett, thank you so much for your testimony and to everyone. Um, one of the things I found challenging in trying to decipher um, what's being said is a lack, is two things. One, the use of jargon, um, you know, just to the extent that you can when you're answering questions, try to, you know, think about a lay audience that doesn't necessarily know what these words mean. Um, and second of all, if you can give examples, specific examples, that would really help. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. First of all, um, could you just, if, if it hasn't already been laid out, what are the overhead fees that the foundation charges? Are they different for different types of things or are they standard? Okay. Um, the Research Foundation, again, we do charge administrative fee. It's an administrative fee we refer to it as. Uh, so what, and that fee is what we use to support our operations. So that fee is based on the actual spend on the sponsored programs. So if there is a project that comes into a college uh, that's funded by a sponsor, a government agency, let's just say uh, NSF, um, that sponsor- What's NSF? I'm National so Science Foundation. Oh, National thank Science you. Got it, got it. Okay. Right. And as the, and it's awarded to one of the CUNY colleges, okay? As that project, uh, as we incur expenses on that project, um, we charge a fee based on the nature of the expenses. So what we would do, this administrative fee, we have different rate categories of um, our fee. So we would charge a specific rate for all personnel related expenditures on a project. For example, uh, employees that are hired on this NSF, National Science Foundation project, as they, we incur expenses, meaning there's payroll generated for the employees on the project. There is a specific rate that the RF would apply to those costs to cover its, its fee, its own, its own operations. There's also a specific rate that we would apply to other types of expenses on these projects. So the, the administrative fee is a mechanism, is a way of us to recover our costs. Sure, and sure. And we have var various rates that we apply based on the nature of the expenses on these sponsored project projects. So is it just two types of expenses, personnel or other than personnel? Uh, there's there's uh, personnel is one category uh, other than OTPS expenses, um, other than personnel expenses. Uh, there's a category for um, ICAs, individual and independent contractor agreements. So there are various categories. Of, and what, so what's the percentage for PS? Uh, 6.75. And what's the percentage for OTPS? Five and a half. So overall, uh, it's around 11 and a half, 12% is your overhead? 
Um, it, it may not equate to that. It's not a total necessarily of the rates. It depends on uh, each project is funded differently. So there may be some projects that don't have an OTPS component or a PS component. So it varies, it varies. Meaning there may be projects that come in that don't have personnel uh, on the project. So there won't be a PS component that we would charge fee against. You know, I'm, I'm just gonna be really honest. I think, I, I understand it a little better now. Mm -hmm. Do you think you could send over to the committee council like five examples of typical projects and sort of what the overhead applied to those are? I think it would sure. be easier or, you know, whatever is a reasonable number. I think that'd be easier for us to sort of decipher um, yes. um, what you're saying, but I really appreciate you're using more lang lay language. I really no do. Yeah. Um, but it's hard. It, it still feels um, like a uh, ball of string that, I, that I'm trying to sort of unravel I, and I, understand. Mm -hmm. Chair, may I continue just a little bit longer? Thank you. Um, so... Do you have, does the Research Foundation actually have employees on the different CUNY campuses? Yes. We have the, the sponsored program activity occurs on the different campuses and we hire those individuals working on those programs. So they're all dispersed at the different campuses. Okay, can I say something really dumb and obvious, but I'm just gonna try to describe what you're saying. So there's a scientist at a CUNY campus who has an idea for a project. They get foundation funding from the National Science Foundation, but the money will go through the research fund and then given to the scientist to do their study. Is the scientist considered the personnel? No. No. I'm trying to understand okay, why there me, would be a research right. foundation person on the CUNY campus. Okay, so CUNY has faculty and staff that apply for these sponsored programs. They're all on CUNY's payroll. They're not RF employees. Okay. These individuals, they apply for these awards. Once they're granted, because we are the fiscal administrator for CUNY, we do the administration of the funds. So the funds are deposited with the RF. The CUNY PI is at one of the locations of CUNY. CUNY, they, I'm sorry, the CUNY PI? Pro, I'm sorry, you're right. Project investigator, the faculty member that's administering the, that received the funds basically. To do the study. To do the study, right. So yeah. the CUNY faculty that received the funds is housed at a CUNY location. It's, it's, it's working from a CUNY location. Um, and the funds, again, are deposited with the RF. The, the project is set up within the RF to administer. Um, the CUNY faculty, at once this award has been granted, would be, may need to hire individuals to work on the project. Ah, I see. Um, someone to do clerical, they may have to hire employees to work on this specific National Science Foundation project. Got it. Those employees that this CUNY faculty hires is going to be charged and paid from the National Science Foundation grant. Right, right. And those employees are who we hire. We hire these individuals uh, for these projects that are going on at the CUNY College. So it could even be like teaching assist fellows that are hired, not just be, administrative, you know, it could be it could graduate be, students. It's it research, could be, graduate students, research assistants. It could be anyone that's needed to administer that on. on could it be awards. faculty or no. part-time faculty? No, adjunct? No. Adjunct, no, there's usually, there's not, we don't um, have faculty on our payroll. That's, they, they're on CUNY payroll. Um, so, adjuncts, yes. I'm sorry, adjuncts, yes. We do okay. have, okay. Yes, we do have the, yes, we can hire adjuncts. Um, so there is some joint, I mean, there is some joint employment, but adjuncts is one of them that we could, 
we do have one on our payroll actually. Okay. And so who negotiates the salaries of all those people? Is it, you know, through the, through the grants? Well, the, the salaries are budgeted for because uh, the National Science Foundation, when they make the award, they're giving a defined budget um, that's been approved for the sponsor to, to use. Right, but usually when somebody applies for a grant, they're gonna put in the salary amounts, right? right. I need five adjuncts at right. this amount. I need three clericals at this amount. Who determines what those dollar amounts are? The CUNY PI, the CUNY, the CUNY faculty member. The CUNY and does, faculty, got it. Does the CUNY faculty member have any guidance or could they be paying an adjunct more than what, you know, for this foundation work compared to uh, an adjunct working at CUNY teaching courses? The, the CUNY faculty member has the guidance of, um, the administrators on their campus as far as how to formulate and submit budget and, and what information to put in there. So with, any, with every college, there is what's called a grants office um, that is responsible for guiding the CUNY faculty with the sponsored programs and giving direction in that regard. Um, but that's essentially a CUNY function. So, um, okay, so if I have a adjunct working on a foundation grant side by side with an adjunct teaching a class, will they be paid the same amount? I, I don't know, honestly. I don't have that information. I don't know for certain what the salary is. I would say there's likely that they would not be paid the same amount uh, because there are, uh, if they're paid on a project, there are requirements as to the budget of the project. Um, but yeah, that that's not something that I've done any um, research on. Okay. Okay, just sort of processing that. Um, so that, got it. So that's something the CUNY campus or the chancellor's office decides and sends that information to each CUNY campus. They follow those guidelines. So you're right. not involved in that. Yeah, the guidelines that we follow are for the sponsored projects. And we pay uh, adjuncts and all employees based on the budgeted amount. Which was uh, submitted by the PI by the sponsor, in the first place. Which right. is submitted by the faculty. What the uh, adjunct at CUNY is being paid and whether it's in line with what the adjuncts on RF payroll are. Is Got it. Not, um, I don't know whether those salaries are in line. Or in Got it. Got it. Got it. Thank you. And so... Um, a different kind of question. What percentage, when you look at all the grants, what percentage are sort of research related versus workforce development? Uh, roughly it's about a little over 30% research related. Um, uh, that's been our, um, we've been holding steady on that percent for some time now. Um, and then there's a population that are more training and workforce related which is, is that I would say in, possibly about a third as well. A third oh, of our overall activity, yes. Thank you. And what's the other third? Um, other pro, uh, pro program, public service, other types of programs considered maybe public service and uh, conferences and stuff of that nature. Okay, a third, a third, a third. Mm -hmm. And um, is that sort of a guiding philosophy? We'll come back, council member. Oh, thank you. Pose another question and then we'll have a second round. Terrific. Um, uh, last question. Um, why of the of all the grants, what percentage of the employees are part time? Um, actually, part time we have. Uh, I would say we have about uh, maybe two thirds that are part time. 
We have a population currently of 6,000 employees, uh, 2,000 of which are full-time and 4,000 are part-time. So it's about two thirds. So in the next round, when I come back, I'd be curious to know a little more about why so many are part-time versus sure. full-time. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much, Chair Barron, appreciate you. Thank you so much, I appreciate your pointed questions. And I do have a few questions before I proceed with other members who have questions. You spoke of part of joint employment. Can you explain what that joint employment is, how it's determined, who pays, what part of the salary, and why people can't be placed in one? Because people have wondered if by splitting a person's employment, that person might not in fact be losing out on some benefits, some pensions, some uh, contributions that would accrue if they were paid by one entity? How do they get their payments? How do they get their W-2 forms? All of that in terms of someone who has a joint employment. Well, the Research Foundation, again, was set up to administer sponsored, pro sponsored programs for CUNY. So all them, and per the 1983 agreement, all employees that are hired on these programs are employees of the RF. So we hire who CUNY tells us to hire on these projects. Okay, we're a single employer. We're not CUNY as far as we don't share same plans and, and benefit plans. And we're a separate single employer from CUNY. Um, so we hire who CUNY tells us to hire on these sponsored projects. Um, so there really is no connection, so to speak. We are a separate entity. We hire the employees that CUNY tells us to hire on sponsored projects. Um, they may be, uh, these individuals may be working in some other capacity. Uh, again, adjuncts and, and graduate students are examples of that at CUNY, but we are responsible for hiring all employees that are on sponsored projects. We hire them through the Research Foundation and um, we have our own benefit plan separate from CUNY in that regard. Um, so that's just the nature of our being uh, per the uh, charter and the 1983 agreement. So why wouldn't an employee get, does an employee get two paychecks? The employee gets a paycheck from the RF. Okay, because we're a separate employer. If the employee is also working at CUNY, they will get a paycheck from CUNY, I suppose. But again, we're two separate employers. We're, we're, the RF is a private non-for-profit corporation that's structured and set up for the administration of these sponsored programs. And, and all the employees working on these sponsored programs are employees of the RF. Um, so we are required to uh, employ these individuals. We're required to pay them um, based on the work they do on these sponsored programs. If by chance, some of them are doing other functions at CUNY, which is a separate entity, separate organization, pub, uh, public university, as if they were doing some other function at another employer. But is it possible? We have different benefit plans. Okay, is it possible then that an employee can be doing one function, one position, but getting paid for that one? function from two sources. I understand somebody may be working on one project at research and then doing something different in CUNY. It's usually, no, it's, it's usually, my understanding is usually different. So what they're doing on a sponsored project is different, separate and apart from what they're doing at CUNY. So sponsored projects have separate uh, purposes. They are separate, um, there's separate works that, that are going on at the CUNY colleges that is separate and apart from their capacity or what they're doing for CUNY. So again, these are individuals working on governmental and private sponsored programs that last for maybe up to a year um, or shorter or longer, somewhat longer, but they are fundings that were in a very defined time period uh, that they work on. And then whatever they're doing, if they're working at any capacity at CUNY would be different from what they're doing on the sponsored project. So what's the median length of time of service for uh, RF employee? Because I have information that says that 80% of them are employees from zero to five years. Uh, but then there's a, there's a 
six to 10 years of service is about 8% of employees in RF. 11 to 15% years of service are 6%. 16 to 20 years of service are 2%. And 21 to 25 are 8%. So let's say those in the 11 to 15 years of service, um, 11 to 15 years of service, are they been, have they been in the same position? doing the same thing? Right. Um, so most of, again, the population that we hire uh, are in sponsored programs. And these programs only last for a designated period of time. OK. And we just have, a, we I have want to say, uh, that information is for the PSC, P, uh, PSC members, just to be clear. OK. We have our central office population, which are much more long-term employees because we're the administrators and managing the functions. There is also a population of employees on our payroll that um, are RF employees, but working in capacity, uh, administrative capacity at CUNY, which may be part of that long-term classification of employee. Okay, but most of, this, most of our population of employee are those sponsored program employees, and they run for defined periods of time the long-term employees you'll find more in the central office, our central office, and the population that of admitted CUNY administrators that are on our payroll that are doing more administrative function, not necessarily, not associated with the, with the sponsored program uh, population. Okay, and be, my last question before I turn it back to my colleagues to ask their questions. Um, if RF is awarded a city contract, uh, usually that process would require that the contract get administered and then reviewed by the uh, city agency and then subsequently uh, sent to the comptroller. Or does that happen here or is CUNY the managing oversight agency of that contract? Uh, with city awards, typically they are reviewed and approved by the agency. Right. And they're registered with the state controller's office and the they're administered. Office. The, the, I'm sorry, they control the controller's office, not the state, the All controller's right. office. I'm sorry. No and they're administered by the RF. The, these agreements are typically administered by the RF. Okay. Uh, thank you. Madam moderator, you can return to my. I want to also acknowledge we've been joined by Council Members Rodriguez and Ulrich, who are both members of the Higher Ed Committee. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you, Chair Barron. We will now turn to Council Member Rodriguez for his questions. Time starts now. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a few, three questions. The first one is, uh, what is the ACNI breakdown of the employee or the research foundations? What is the employee breakdown? In the ACNI background, do you have it, yes or no? Oh, uh, yes, yes, we do. Yes. Can you share with us? Yes, okay. Um, so I mentioned that we have a pro approximately 6,000 employees. Um, 10,000 are American Indian. Uh, 1,000 are Asian, 1,075 to be exact. Uh, 1,153 are Black. Uh, 1,402 1, are Hispanic. Uh, 690 are not classified. Uh, two, I'm sorry, uh, 135 are two or more races. Uh, 1596 are white. Okay, so so this the foundation is led. Does that also include at the leadership position of the of yes, the foundation? It's, yes, it's all employees. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. My second question: Does the does the research foundation has any interaction with the institutes, including the Puerto Rican, Dominican, the Haitian? the Africans institutes? Uh, we, um, I mean, our, our interaction is with the CUNY colleges. There may be 
award, if there are awards granted to an institute that's we're administering only to that capacity. But again, we are the fiscal agent for all CUNY. So if there are funds being granted to one of those entities, they would be administered by the RF. Okay, but in this particular case, and then I'm going to one of my top priority, it, are you aware of, or, or of course, in, in your, the capacity as a, a, not you as an individual, but as a research foundation, are you aware or do you get to also look at, at centers such as the Puerto Rican a center has any fiscal challenge? I'm sorry, do, do we check to see if uh, Puerto as Rican- administrator, As administrator role that you play the, the research, are you aware if there's any challenge going on with the Puerto Rican center? No. With the center um, of Puerto Rican, yeah. Yeah, that, that function is really a CUNY function. We don't, we're not um, in, involved in any challenges of that extent. Again, if any sponsored awards are given to any unit of CUNY, we would administer those, those funds on behalf of CUNY but we're not engaged in addressing uh, those issues. Those are CUNY issues that are typically addressed by CUNY. But if, if, if the research administrator, uh, of, and, and of course, like if, 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 if you have different explanation, you say that the, that the research play a role of administrator of the funding? The Research Foundation administers the sponsored programs. So all sponsored programs that are allocated to a CUNY college are sent to the Research Foundation to administer. Okay. Uh, and by administer, I mean that we set up on our books and records these funds and we process transactions um, at your request, at CUNY's request against those funds in compliance with sponsor guidelines. Right. And are you aware of any fiscal challenges of one of those centers from Puerto Rican, Dominican, Haitians? I'm not aware, no. Okay, and uh, okay, so, so those are my question. And my comment is, uh, 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 as, as chair, you are a big supporter uh, with the, research, with the uh, uh, centers and institute. And I feel that uh, if anyone from CUNY can also let her know what is going on with the Puerto Rican Study Center is something that I know it is important for all of us. I think that uh, one challenge that I have seen in the past is that funding has been allocated to centers. Uh, I think that there has not been a complete uh, clarity when it comes to how the money moved from the moment when we allocated, in this case, from the city council to Time the center, time. and then going to, in this case, CUNY. And if the Research Foundation play an administrative role, I think it is important also uh, that they share with us if there is any fiscal challenges uh, going on in any of the institute. I think that right now, uh, I have seen how you know, some challenges are affecting the Puerto Rican Center, a center that for me, as a born and raised Dominican, I know how important it are to connect our students to the research that have happened for so many decades, not only among the Dominican Study Center, but also with the Puerto Ricans and the African and the Haitian. So I also wanted to highlight and bring to your attention that I hope also that in your role as a chairman, working with it, it's some of the funders of the, of the Puerto Rican study centers, uh, we will work with them to be sure that we provide all the support they need. Now that the, in that the uh, director, Edwin, uh, step out from that position, I think it is important that the leadership of the Institute continue playing the role to identify how they will be bringing the new uh, director of the center. And I think that this is something that I hope no one outside the leadership or the funders or the institute or the Puerto Rican Center will be the one deciding who will be the best person that fulfill all the requirements to be the director of that institute. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Council Member Rodriguez. Um, I have many more questions, so I'll start with them now. And I thank you uh, for your explanation and for taking the time to respond to these questions. They're very, very important. As I have said, this is probably the first time. So this is giving us a lot of the uh, basic information which we have not had on the record previously. What are the properties that are owned and leased by the Research Foundation? Uh, the Research Foundation doesn't own any properties. Um, the Research Foundation, as I mentioned earlier, is a sole member of an LLC, uh, 230 West 31st Street LLC. And that entity is, uh, was established to own the building, the office building in which we're housed. Well, that confuses me. You're sure. the sole member of an entity that owns the property, but you don't own the property. Right. It's a separate entity. The, the 230 West 41st Street is a separate li limited liability uh, company that was established to own that property. Uh, the Research Foundation is only a member, a sole member of the entity. Um, okay. But just, uh, and, it's, and that entity has its own tax ID number. It's a separate entity altogether. Okay. So yes. Mm -hmm. and, and do you have any endowments? Does the Research Foundation have any endowments? No, no, we don't. You have any stock investments? No, not okay. not outside of just our normal investment portfolio. Okay, um, you used to publish annual reports that included each individual grant that had been awarded, but the last copy that the committee committee was able to recover was from two thousand and six. Does RF still produce these annual reports, and if not, why not? Right, I think um, on our website, we do have the last one at 2016. Um, um, and since then, we have not published them. Uh, that was a leadership decision at the time. Uh, we're at a point now where we're looking to post that information on our website, uh, possibly not in a formal published document, but uh, in some kind of report form. Don't you think that that's really obfuscating what the organization does and its efficiency to reduce information sharing and say, we don't think that we should continue to inform uh, the population as to what awards we've gotten? Yeah, I, I think um, at that time- I'm that they did that decision to, to end it, you know, very, I mean, no, no, People it's are talking about being more and more right. and more transparent. Right, right. And I agree. I agree. And that's something that we're looking to do, maybe not in um, a published book form, but the information that we want to provide out there are definitely the numbers so that the community can see what kind of activity is generated at the various colleges. And that's what we're in the process of doing now. So from 2016 onward, we will be posting that information to identify the grant, the award activity that was uh, received uh, by the various colleges. I would think that the Research Foundation would want to crow about all the great work they've done and how much money they've gotten and the increases and competitive awards. So mm -hmm. I certainly would encourage that to happen. Thank you. That's uh, what we, thank you. Okay. That's definitely yeah. something we're working on. Thank you. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Is there an operational or other agreement between the Research Foundation and CUNY? other than what you've talked about that spells out the obligations or is that that same agreement that you talked about? It's, it's pretty much the same agreement, uh, the 1983 agreement. Uh, okay. there, um, is also I'm gonna speed it up a little. And does that agreement uh, have what's called the arm's length uh, provision where each entity is represented by legal counsel? The agreement was signed by a representative of CUNY and RF. And this is oh, a 1983 is agreement. Length, is, that, is there the arm's length provision so that we don't, as you talk about keeping the funds separate, is there arm's length? In other words, you know, when you go to buy a house, you don't want to have the same lawyer as the person who's selling you the house. Two separate entities, a research foundation and CUNY. So there were two separate individuals, a representative from CUNY signing the agreement as well as the RF. Okay. Um, so if a, an employee of RF had is working at a campus and there is a, a, an issue that comes up, personnel matter that comes up and it involves conditions on the campus. How does that matter get resolved? 
Um, that matter, uh, if this is an RF employee, that matter could be taken to uh, the RF Human Resource Department. Again, we have our own Human Resource Area uh, Department that that uh, issue could be addressed to. Uh, we also have a uh, whistleblower hotline if there was an anonymous complaint that needs to be addressed. Um, the issue could also be brought to the college HR department um, because again, we are in direct contact with the various colleges on certain uh, di divisions. Um, and also to the CUNY PI, the, the one who's leading the sponsor project. Okay. So there are various ways in which the, that, that complaint could be sent. To the Thank you. To be addressed. Can you describe how recovery accounts, which sponsor reimbursements to individual CUNY colleges for costs incurred to carry out sponsored programs, works? Does each college have the same amount in their account? And if so, what is that amount? And can you describe the types of reimbursements colleges may claim and for how much? Right. So the, the college recovery accounts. Uh, and is, that's a general term. That's typically the indirect cost recovery account is the main recovery account of each college. Um, so there are different balances in each account. Um, and um, that account is, is housed at the RF. We administer those funds on behalf of CUNY. So uh, again, we talked about um, the college when they receive an award to administer on their campus, they are entitled to recovery of their course. Um, so there's a course to them to administer these funds on campus. Uh, they're using electricity, they're using heat, they have building maintenance that there that is a course to the organization and sponsors allow the, the college to be reimbursed for those costs. Um, that's what we're calling indirect course that the colleges would receive and those funds are typically deposited in what we call a recovery account at the RF. And those funds are typically used for various purposes, mainly to uh, advance research at the various colleges and to support other uh, PIs in their uh, research endeavors. Uh, you may recall the incident of City College president uh, being cited for inappropriate use, personal use of funds. And how was that situation resolved? And what mechanisms are in place to prevent that type of um, occurrence? Right, um, that, that um, incident, I believe, was uh, an incident that was at City College. Um, so what I know, what has been put in place, meaning the RF wasn't cited in any of that incident. I mean, we, what I know that has been put in place that CUNY has implemented um, in December of 2017, uh, to uh, they've adopted guidelines on how to administer uh, non-tax levy funds, or, or actually what is the proper uh, allowable use and non-use of non-tax levy funds. So the adoption of those new guidelines have been implemented um, so that there's proper understanding of how those funds should be used going forward. And the RF has adopted those guidelines uh, that the CUNY Board of Trustees have, have uh, approved. So how did that, uh, was it approved by a board in that instance, those personal items, those personal purchases? Was I don't, I, I don't have any information of, not by an RF board. I'm not, I don't believe it was approved um, by any board. I think these are transactions that, uh, Again, with uh, not just recovery accounts, but with sponsored accounts, there is a CUNY official, a CUNY PI that approves transactions and sends them to the RF for processing. And that was an example of one transaction that was approved by a CUNY official and then sent to the RF for processing. Um, okay. And how does, a how does a college go about requesting that type of reimbursement? Uh, the reimbursement, uh, which type of reimbursement, I'm sorry? Uh, the sponsored reimbursement. The, um, so the reimbursements that the colleges are entitled to as far as overhead? Overhead, indirect costs. Right, okay, so those reimbursements are budgeted for 
uh, sponsor approved. And they're typically reimbursed on a transactional basis. So as um, the project incurs direct costs, um, the sponsor will improve at indirect cost rate. It's a rate that's applied to specific direct costs. And they recover those, uh, they, they're reimbursed on a transactional basis. We have systems in place and mechanism in place to make these entries of uh, reimbursements to the college recovery accounts. So they're, they're essentially um, rate-based and they apply to direct costs on the project. Uh, two more questions, uh, and then I'm gonna shift to see if other colleagues have questions. So you said that there were recommendations that were given and put in place so that we don't have the similar kinds of occurrence how, can you share those recommendations with us or tell us where exactly we can find them? Yeah, the, what I was referring to was what's considered um, uh, the board approved um, CUNY matrix. It's a document that was created and prepared that identifies what's an allowable cost versus um, prohibited cost on non-tax levy funds. Um, this is something that I believe is posted on the website, CUNY's website. Um, so I could, um, we could, I can make note of uh, providing that to you. Okay, great. And what is, uh, how does the research foundation go about funding or creating capital construction projects? And how do they get prioritized? Yeah, capital construction projects are um, basically um, at the direction of CUNY. Um, again, we don't do this independent of CUNY. These are requests that come from uh, one of the colleges. Um, and they're either supported on a sponsored project or maybe one of their recovery accounts. But these requests are CUNY initiatives that they um, initiate uh, transactions and, and we process them at their request. So these are not projects that we internally RF uh, spearhead and direct and prioritize. These are done at the individual CUNY colleges. So for the money that I'm trying to get a better understanding of this, mm -hmm. if, if the state now is giving additional funds for capital projects to CUNY, are those the types of projects that you would then be involved with? No, also, you no. only be involved with projects. Yes, right. That so, right. The, the, yeah, this, whatever the state is giving to CUNY for capital projects we're not involved in. What we are involved in is, is whatever is going to be funded through a sponsored project. A sponsor. Maybe some renovation of an award that's going to be funded by a sponsored project in those cases that we would be involved in. And again, all of that is going to be initiated by someone at a CUNY college. Okay, great. Um, Madam moderator, are there other council members that have questions? We don't have any other council members with their hands raised at this time. I'm double checking. It looks like we can move on or you can uh, continue with your line of question. Okay. Um, I think most of my questions have been answered. Oh, I have another question. How many programs does RF run? You have a number of how many programs you're currently administering? Yeah, currently we have about uh, 4,000 800 active projects that we're administering. Um, and then again, that number changes based on the volume. Um, so if volume is up, the number, the count of projects would increase versus when they're down. And so what's the current, average, I'm sorry. No, that's all, I'm sorry. And what's the average length of time? I know they vary, but what's the average length of time of a particular of project? I, I wanted, uh, average is about a year. Most of them run at least a yeah. year, right? Um, there may be some that run for a shorter period, uh, some that may be extended. There, there are some projects sponsors will allow extensions, but typically I would say a year is an average uh, turnaround time for a project. And then in terms of the evaluation of the project, who does that? Is that a part of the description uh, that the sponsor creates when they do their project? How do we know that it's been successful? Who does that evaluation and where is that noted? The about, well, that's uh, the evaluation is all a CUNY uh, faculty function um, in coordination with the sponsor. So the RF is only involved in the administration of the funds. Uh, anything as far as oversight and evaluation, it would be something the CUNY faculty would be working with the sponsor on. Okay. Um, 
So what compliance and internal controls exist to ensure that monies granted to the foundation go towards CUNY research purposes or otherwise ensure the integrity of a foundation operation? Yeah, the Research Foundation has uh, a number of policies and procedures that are in place. We have uh, controls that are in place within our systems to ensure that only authorized individuals have access to their sponsored funds. Uh, we do, uh, we have uh, financial systems that have uh, checks and balances in place to ensure that, um, our, of course, our systems are uh, in sync. Um, and we have, um, ongoing audits to, to verify and confirm. Um, but again, our policies and procedures and compliance with them is what we uh, consider to be uh, the, the strength of our internal controls. And uh, what is the status of the Grants Plus Incorporation? Or do you still have a relationship or an affiliation with them? Uh, Grants Plus, uh, we, that activity, that entity's uh, closed in June of 2019. And what, what prompted that? Um, it was an entity that was created, um, again, to uh, offer um, sponsored program activity to other nonprofits other than CUNY and RF, um, but it just wasn't a profitable entity, um, and it's kind of run its course, so we, we ended that entity. And do you have any role in supporting CUNY's intellectual property ownership rights and royalties? No, that's, that's a purely a CUNY function. Okay. Um, and what is the status of the Inspector General's investigation? I believe there was an investigation that was held. Is that concluded? And was there a report? Um, I'm not aware of any um, a status of that investigation. I assume you're talking about the City College? Yes. That, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, that, the RF was not a, a told that we're a subject of that investigation. We have not seen or received any report from the Inspector General or City College. Okay, great, thank you. Madam Moderator, are there other members who have questions? No, at this time, there are no other council members with their hand raised in Zoom. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Bramlett, I wanna thank you for your thank time you. and for sharing the information. Uh, and we appreciate your being here today. Thank, thank you, so you so much for having me. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Madam Moderator, are there, is there another panel? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Barron. So we have concluded the Research Foundation's testimony and we'll now turn to public testimony. First, I'd like to remind everyone that I will call up individuals and panels. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin your testimony once the Sergeant at Arms sets the clock and gives you the cue. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Remember that it, there, Remember that there is a few second delay when you are unmuted before we can hear you. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. The first panel on public testimony in order of speaking will include Barbara Bowen, President of PSC CUNY, Lori Rothstein, a Delegate Research Foundation Field Unit Delegate at PSC CUNY, Naomi Zauderer, Associate Executive Director of PSC CUNY, and David Derozami, a professor at City College. Barbara Bowen, you may be, President Bowen, you may begin once the sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Great, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Chair Barron, for holding this hearing, for your persistence in holding the hearings, and also thank you for the introduction where uh, you had a chance to celebrate the long march to victory of the campaign for fiscal equity. Um, Cause those students 20 years ago, they've all now passed through CUNY and where they were underfunded also. Uh, so thank you so much for that. And thank you for your focus on this. Thank you also, I know some of the council members had another hearing, but I'm very grateful to them too. Um, I, I will not present formal testimony. I, I want to say just briefly, that um, the uh, Professional Staff Congress is proud 
to represent the employees at the central office of the Research Foundation. And I think it's important to draw a distinction between the largely full-time employees at the central office who do the processing of grants, uh, who do the expert work of auditing and other um, financial and administrative work. That's one component and we represent that small group of employees. And then we also represent some uh, we would like to represent all, but we represent some of the employees who are um, uh, employed by the Research Foundation. We were speaking about them earlier on the various CUNY campuses um, and who are employed through grant funds. Um, there, many, many more of the employees are part-time employees. Um, and we have serious concerns about the conditions for those employees, about the difficulty of negotiating contracts for those employees. So um, we, uh, we believe that all employees should be, as you know, you know this, um, these uh, should be treated fairly, should have full benefits and compensation, and that many of the employees that uh, whom we represent have been part-time for years and years and years. Um, and so uh, we struggle with them and on their behalf to have professional and fair conditions. And we do that in concert with the, um, what you heard about the PIs, the principal investigators, who are the faculty or staff who apply for and achieve these grants. Those are our members. They want fairness too. And uh, we, we try to work together to achieve that. So I'm really pleased that we have um, one of the Research Foundation employees from one of the campuses with us, and then Naomi Zouder from our staff who has led the negotiations on their contracts. And I am happy to, and I know uh, David Gerozami from his really terrific work as a faculty leader at City College. I'm excited to hear what he's gonna say too. So I'm very pleased to be here and I'll stop with that and just thank you all for being here and I'm very pleased to have your probing questions, Chair Barron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will have uh, Lori Rothstein. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, I have a rather long statement. It's quite detailed. I'm unfortunately going to have to speed read it to you. I will submit it uh, in writing as a backup. So I'm going to navigate to that now and begin reading. My name is Lori Rothstein. I'm an employee of the Research Foundation. I've worked at the Graduate Center for more than 20 years. I'm the elected delegate for the Research Foundation field units of the Professional Staff Congress, the union that represents CUNY faculty and staff. Altogether, Research Foundation projects employ more than 13,000 people each year across CUNY's 26 campuses. This is a figure from approximately last year when I originally prepared this. Research Foundation employees work on a wide variety of projects and grants. Their work improves the lives of the most underprivileged New Yorkers through projects including adult literacy, workforce development, job placement, and small business development. They engage in and support cutting edge research in economics, the humanities, international affairs, and the sciences. CUNY Research Foundation employees on the campuses experience the same stresses created by the chronic underfunding of CUNY as a whole and suffer from the same structural inequalities inflicted on the publicly funded, publicly funded employees of the university. Recent records on the three organized campuses, the Graduate Center, New York City College of Technology, City Tech, and LaGuardia Community College show that more than 60% of Research Foundation employees are classified as part-time B, meaning that they work 19 or fewer hours per week. Around 4% are part-time A, working between 19 and 35 hours per week. The rest around 36% are full-time, working 35 hours per week. Just under a quarter, 23.45% of all Research Foundation employees in PSC-covered units are paid $18 an hour or less. This is one cent more per hour than the subsistence wage identified by the MIT living wage scale for the New York metropolitan area. Median hourly pay for the part-time A's is around $21 an hour. Overall, 40.51% of the unit is paid between $18 and $32.91 per hour, $32.91 per hour. The upper number in that range is, is the subsistence wage for a single parent with one child based on the MIT living wage scale. 
the annual median salary for full-timers is around $52,000 a year. To understand the financial position of the Research Foundation labor pool, it is necessary to examine what living and subsistence mean in this context. These terms do not indicate anything near what most of us assume to be a reasonable level of financial security and comfort. I urge everyone to review the MIT technical standards and to consider for themselves the position that those receiving the so-called living wage, and especially those receiving less, are actually in. Out of these meager wages, full-time and part-time A employees must also pay a 19% health insurance premium for coverage. Part-time B employees have no access to employer-based health insurance. Vacation accrual, holidays, and weather days are another area in which part-timers are undercompensated. No part-time employees receive paid holidays or weather days. Non-instructional part-time employees are in vacation on a prorated system based on longevity. Instructional part-time employees earn no vacation time. Meanwhile, full-time employees receive 17 paid holidays each year. The lack of paid holidays and weather days for part-timers is especially burdensome for working parents. Lost hours must be made up within the same two-week pay period. We hear from our members that the money earned on makeup days, and sometimes more, often goes right back out to pay additional childcare costs. These policies exacerbate the inequality in wages between full-timers and part-timers, hurting the most the people who can least afford the loss of income. There are by, no, by definition no unskilled workers at research foundation projects. The majority of positions require a bachelor's degree or above, computer skills, and relative, relevant work experience, yet a significant percent, percentage of employees are paid as if they lack one or both. Part-timers and new hires often do not have pay parity with their peers performing the same work, even when accounting for the lack of benefits for the part-timers. There is also no system for retaining employees when their grants run out and thus keeping their expertise acuity. Meanwhile, at the Research Foundation Central Office, the contract, which covers full-timers only, shows a minimum salary range of $46,000 to $82,000 per year, grade three and above, depending on rank. The top administrators make well in excess of $250,000. These statistics and policies tell us all we need to know. Research Foundation employees on the campuses are largely part-timers who are undercompensated and treated as disposable labor, while at the same time the university trumpets its world-class research inefficient research initiatives. It is time for the system of exploitation to change. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Naomi Zauder. Time starts now. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Um, for holding this hearing. Um, I uh, was really grateful to, to see that it was restored to the docket. I too do not have formal testimony. Um, I did just want to um, clarify a few things that I heard today. Um, one is in terms of the longevity of employees, the, the numbers that uh, Chair Barron had given uh, did not include uh, central office employees, um, but even if it had, the uh, it would have, and the number of central office employees is so small, it would have had a very negligible impact on those percentages. The truth is that there are a fair number of employees, Lori Rothstein among them, who have been very long-term employees of the RF. Um, these are, uh, it is not, I mean, yes, there are people who are on short-term projects, but there is, there are also a substantial proportion who are really doing the work of the university under the mantle of the RF as a private employer. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, Chair Barron for um, asking about the annual reports that had, the detailed annual reports that had ceased in 2016. Um, those uh, actually included information on every single grant that the RF received and, and who the recipients were. We would very much like to see that reporting restored. Uh, and um, 
And finally, I do just want to call the committee's attention to the fact that um, that the RF's testimony actually acknowledged that they hire who CUNY tells them to, mm -hmm. which in, is indicative of um, a, a lack of true separation between the entities. Um, I would, in my experience representing employees at the RF, I have seen the boundaries between CUNY and the RF to be very fluid. And um, it's, uh, I, We'll leave it at that. Thank you for your testimony. Before I turn back to Chair Barron for questions, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand. Oh, my apologies. We have one more person uh, who is supposed to testify. Uh, very sorry about that. Um, David Jarozami, you may begin when the sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Chair Barron and members of the New York City Council Committee on Higher, on Higher Education. My name is David Jerozalmi and I'm a professor of chemistry and biochemistry at City College of New York. I'm also the chair of the City College Faculty Senate and I'm a member of the CUNY University Faculty Senate Research Foundation Faculty Council. And as a result, I'm a, I'm a member of the RF's board of directors. We welcome the involvement of the New York City Council in oversight of, of the CUNY RF. I represent CUNY faculty and as such will only speak from this perspective. So for CUNY faculty, the CUNY RF is the fiscal agent for research awards, grants, and contracts. The CUNY RF manages a number of functions for running all of these awards, grants, and contracts. And as such, the CUNY RF is a crucial tool for the research mission of the City University of New York. And in turn, the research mission is an important component of the access and excellence missions to educate the children of the whole people of New York City. Now in 2015, the City College Faculty Senate published results of a survey of faculty satisfaction in the services provided by the CUNY RF. This survey found deep dissatisfaction in the processes and services of the RF. Though many CUNY clients, faculty clients, reported positive interactions with CUNY RF employees. The 2015 survey was followed by a satisfaction survey commissioned by the RF itself in 2018. And this more recent survey confirmed the findings of the 2015 survey and identified some specific areas of concern. The appointment of Gail Horwitz in 2019 as interim president of the CUNY RF brought with it an honesty and willingness to change to the RF. And she led an effort to improve some of the services provided by the RF and to honestly and openly engage with faculty who wish to work with the RF to reform the RF and into a more efficient partner for faculty research. And in just a, just a few months on the job as interim president, uh, Jarnay Bremlet has impressed me not only with her willingness to take a critical look at the CUNY RF, but also by her personal example of openness and transparency. CUNY, have, CUNY faculty have every reason to expect that Jarnay Bramlett's tenure as president will bring important changes to the RF, and we look forward to continuing to work with her in fulfilling the RF's work in CUNY's teaching and research missions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Before I turn back to the chair for questions, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate that you have a question for this panel. Chair Barron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rivera. I, I'm always pleased to have panelists give testimony who are the ones who are in the field with that shoulder to the wheel and uh, the boots on the ground and doing the interaction. So I, I certainly thank you. And in, in fact, much of what was used to be able to present questions to Ms. Bramlett generated from conversations that I've had with PSC about the questionable practices that seem to result 
in gross inequity and lack of employee benefits and security. So we're very much concerned about that. And we think that at, at this time, particularly where we're, we're having that push to get equity in so many areas and to increase the number of, you know what I'm going to say, Black and Latino persons also, not only in the general, but at those decision-making levels. We're looking to make sure that we can do that. And I just want to thank you for your testimony and for sharing your experiences and for highlighting the differences uh, and the limitations that are put on employees who are part A, part-time A, as, a, as compared to part-time B. We know when they keep you under 20 hours, it uh, limits what their obligations are. So it's interesting that it caps at 20. And also the fact that <laughs> the rate of pay is just, what was it a penny less than what would be qualified uh, to be in another category? So I thank you for your testimony. Look forward to continuing to hear from you and your input as we now that we have some floor to look at in terms of the research foundation can explore how we can make them better, particularly hearing that there seems to be someone at the helm who's interested in being more transparent and looking at how we can make improvements in the research foundation. So I thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Chair Barron. Thank, thank you. you. Madam moderator. Seeing no other council members waiting to ask questions, uh, we can turn to the next panel. Uh, just a reminder that I will, that once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin your testimony once the sergeant at arms sets the clock and gives you the cue. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Remember that there is a few second delay when you're unmuted before we can hear you. Please wait for the sergeant at arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. The first panel in order of speaking will include, just hold on one moment. Looks like we lost two of our witnesses. So we will hear next from Jose Luis Rodriguez from the National Puerto Rican Agenda. You may begin when the sergeant gives you the cue. Time starts now. Thank you. I'm Jose Luis Rodriguez. I'm, a, I'm representing the National Puerto Rican Agenda and its president, Nilda Ruiz. Uh, the National Puerto Rican Agenda is a national organization composed of multiple uh, Puerto Rican organizations and individuals throughout the United States. And uh, it's a nonpartisan organization that addresses uh, uh, Puerto Rican issues. Uh, I'm the uh, coordinator of the MPRA New York uh, uh, Central Advocacy Campaign uh, 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 effort that the MPRA is waging here in New York. Uh, we, uh, we would like to thank the Madam Chair, Ines Barron, for giving us an opportunity to uh, speak at this hearing. We, uh, and we also would like to thank the whole committee. And specifically, we would like to thank uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Member Idanis Rodriguez, and especially for his uh, bringing up the central uh, issue uh, to uh, to this uh, committee in the in his earlier intervention, I also would like to commend the um, uh, chair uh, Baron uh, for the announcement that was made uh, uh, for that hard fought uh, uh, battle that have finally been won by New York City, and I'm sure it's going to be a benefit uh, to all New Yorkers. Uh, uh, 
not only to uh, black and brown New Yorkers, but all New Yorkers will benefit uh, from that announcement. Uh, today, I'm here uh, to bring a, a very important issue that is uh, impacting the Puerto Rican community, not only in New York, but throughout the country. And that is the situation at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. Uh, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies is experiencing an existential crisis. For the last few years, decisions that have been made by uh, the Hunter College uh, administration has uh, put in jeopardy uh, the existence of the center. The center is the most prestigious uh, research and um, the uh, uh, depository of uh, information and history of the, the and, and Hi, documents Mr. the diaspora experience in this country. And we, um, we want, uh, we would like to have uh, this council um, uh, engage in requesting a hearing, uh, a full hearing uh, at your earliest convenience so that uh, the issues surrounding Central could be addressed. Uh, MPRA has requested uh, through FOIA information from Hunter College on uh, funding and areas of funding in areas of academic status, in areas of uh, relocation. And, uh, uh, and we, uh, we have not gotten any answers. Uh, as per statute, uh, we intend to appeal uh, that. Uh, we have asked our attorneys to do that. Uh, but today we would like to respectfully request that the council do a hearing where not only our community can participate and express itself in terms of what's going on, especially the academic community, but also that uh, we can uh, uh, hear from uh, uh, Hunter College and other uh, CUNY officials as to uh, what what the future of Central is going to be and how to correct uh, whatever is going on there. We also would like to ask the council that um, the funding for Central, uh, instead of being uh, uh, continuously diminished, uh, that it be increased. And and very important, we want uh, Hunter College to undertake a permanent search uh, for a director uh, as soon as possible. And that the, this, that process conclude uh, expeditiously and that it includes, uh, uh, the, that it follows uh, the tradition that all uh, uh, searches for directors have uh, take it in the past. So uh, again, uh, we will be submitting a written testimony also, uh, written information uh, to the committee. And I would like to thank uh, the staff for assisting us with, with this um, presentation today. And uh, I just learned that the other two individuals that were going to testify uh, had to uh, leave. One has an emergency and uh, and they, I guess the moderator just explained. Uh, but the, uh, we thank again the committee for our participation today. Thank you for your testimony. If we have inadvertently missed anyone who would like to testify, can you please use the raise hand function in Zoom now? Seeing no one else of, um, with the raised hand to testify, Chair Barron, I'd like to turn to you for questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rivera. I, I wanna thank Mr. Rodriguez for coming and participating in this hearing and for raising the issue that he has. And we certainly are concerned about all of those institutes and every aspect of CUNY that uh, affects how we're able to deliver and make sure that the students and the faculty are entitled to receiving the best support and services and instruction that they possibly can. So we thank you for your testimony. Uh, 
Madam Moderator, are there any other persons wishing to testify? No, and there are no council members with raised hands either. Thank you. Uh, that being the case, I want to say yes. Once again, I'm extremely pleased with the legislature that has finally put into the budget the money that's needed for the campaign for fiscal equity. But let me just say, it's been there all this time. So we are not resting. We're not just saying it's done. We're going to make sure that we exert the necessary pressure to make it happen. Because the legislature for low these many years has failed to make it happen. So yes, while we're celebrating that the money is there, we're going to make sure. So those of us who understand how important it is that our young people get the basic sound education that they need that will advance them to CUNY and not have them take remedial classes because they did not get the foundation that they needed in public school. We're gonna make sure that we continue this battle and make sure that this money rolls out and gets to those districts and those schools. We've lost at least a generation of children who did not get what they needed. But now we have this opportunity to make the coming generations whole and to use this money also to, to see what kinds of programs can uh, restore what was missed for those generations and those people who suffered. So I'm pleased about that. I'm excited about that. And also about the uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Scholarship. And I wanna thank Ms. Bramlett. I see that she has stayed for the duration and that's always a good sign. I'm pleased to have her uh, be here and be a part and look forward to getting a better relationship as we understand the uh, possibilities of what we can do. I want to thank my staff again, and I want to thank everyone for participating. And with that, I'm going to use my shake array to have the conclusion of this hearing. This concluding, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.